big blue ocean. Uh, a little storm. With the electrical gremlin under control, we still found ourselves plagued with the starboard engine overheating. Unable to diagnose the problem, we decided to make sure we didn't have something blocking the cooling water intake on the sail drive. This would require getting in the water with a mask and snorkel. Oh, say it again. I had it turned off. Where are you? Where are you? No, no, no way. Should we leave you here? Big blue ocean. Shark Big bait. Blue. Shark bait. That's ah. blue. <laughs> All right, let's go. Yeah, Enough. Need to go back in and wash that off. Oh. For shaking. Your blue bada bee bada. My face blue? Your head? No, that went away. Hitting something out at sea is extremely rare. When it does happen, it's usually something floating at the surface like fishing nets, marker buoys, or similar items where the biggest threat is that their lines can tangle in the propeller or get caught on the rudders. The potential for catastrophe does exist, though, so it's important to be prepared for anything. Case in point, this rather close call with this unknown floating object. Things the old fashioned way here. The wrist, wrist sundial. What's it say our ETA is according to that? 30 hours. 30 hours? I like that one better. Yeah. So we go up a wave and we're at three days away, and we go down the wave, we're at one day away. Yeah, just keep going down. Go down like 5,000 feet to go out of the What did we say? It was 16,000 feet. Yeah. This church says 16,000 feet deep. No, oh, yeah, this area. 16,000 feet? Not 100 feet. 1,000. I wish I knew that before I went snorkeling. That would have made all the difference in the world. Yeah, I'm not crazy. We've just had dinner, and now I'm gonna take a nap because my wife, my night watch starts at 10 to 1 a.m. So it's probably about 8:30 now, I think. So we're gonna get some rest. Hopefully, we'll be in Morehead City in um, less than 48 hours. We hope. As we got closer to the coast, the shipping traffic increased and the weather became more unsettled. This gave us the opportunity to appreciate the value of having instruments like radar and AIS, especially at night. Here we can see a ship that has recently crossed in front of us. We can see both a radar return blip as well as a triangle, which is an AIS target indicator. Clicking on the triangle brings up a wealth of important information. Later, an AIS target appears showing a ship heading right at us. As we can see in the upper left, moving the cursor to the target shows that it is about 21 miles away. 
clicking on it brings up the AIS information. This information includes the name of the ship, its position information, radio information, the size of the vessel, its course over ground and speed over ground, and the most important, the closest point of approach and the time until that closest point of approach. We can then radio to the ship and coordinate alterations of course and speed in order to avoid a collision. AIS stands for Automatic Identification System and every commercial vessel is required to transmit this information via radio frequencies. This also allows a redundancy with traditional radar. This shows the ocean currents of the North Atlantic Ocean. The intensity of the Gulf Stream current along the east coast of the United States is clearly visible. A 60 mile wide path of two and a half to as much as five knots of moving water that can make the waves range from uncomfortable to downright deadly. Taking it lightly has doomed many a vessel. The squally weather that we encountered did us no favors, as it churned up the waves and made the wind variable and unpredictable. What do you got? Uh, a little storm. Yeah, we're in the ship all around us. Having radar is a huge help, as it allows us to see squalls as much as 30 miles away or more. It takes some of the mystery and surprise out of the equation and allows us to make better decisions. This squall may not look like much, but on the radar, with the rings here set to two mile increments, we can see that squall is nearly five miles long. Having this kind of information, we can change course to avoid the squall if possible, or at least prepare by reefing or reducing the wind area of the sails well in advance. As we enter the heart of the Gulf Stream current, the wind picks up more and shifts more from the direction that we want to go. With conditions like this, it's like sailing in a washing machine. Yep, this is the Gulf Stream crossing. The best way to decrease the stress on the vessel and the crew is to simply slow down a little. Most sailors can do this by reefing even further and tacking farther off the wind. But being relative novices, we decide to drop the sails and turn the motors on. This would give us a bit more control over our speed and reduce the effect of the highly variable conditions. The wind and sea would actually get even worse. Eventually we put the cameras away to focus our attention. It would have been easy to freak out, but we knew Caterpillar could handle it. When boats are designed and built, they earn what's called a design category. Design category D is inland or sheltered coastal waters with winds up to 16 knots. Design category C is inshore. This represents boats operating in coastal waters, large bays, and lakes with winds up to 27 knots and seas up to 7 feet high. Design category B is offshore. This rating includes boats operating well offshore with winds up to 40 knots and significant seas up to 13 feet. But Caterpillar was designed and built as a design category A, which is ocean. 
This rating covers largely self-sufficient boats designed for extended voyages with winds of over 40 knots and significant wave heights above 13 feet, but excluding abnormal conditions such as hurricanes. So as wild as this ride was, we were all confident that, as Drew said, we'll be all right. During the night, we cleared the Gulf Stream and the weather improved. Our spirits followed suit as the sun rose through the morning clouds in spectacular fashion. So after how many days have you been at sea? Nine. Ten days? Nine days? This is our first sight of land. land Every day, pretty much, we find one or two of these puppies on our deck. And our job is to uh, rehabilitate them and release them into the wild. So I think this one's pretty much ready to go. Fly and be free. Yep. Another successful re entry into the wild. Well, here we are at Moorhead City at the Portside Marina at the diesel dock. We've landed here finally after almost 10 days at sea, uh, maybe nine days, whatever it is. I've lost track of even what day it is. And uh, we, are, we are on the phone with U.S. Customs and Immigration, and they are taking information and they're sending someone down to check the boat and clear us in. And then we will be on our way from here. So here we are in Moorhead City. As we stepped off the boat and tried to remember what normal life was like, one thing was clear. This was not just an experience or an adventure. It was more than that. A long ocean crossing like this on a sailboat changes you. It fundamentally alters your DNA. You can go back to land, but you can never go back to being the person you were before. You are different now. on the next leg of Sailing SV Caterpillar. So we just left the hey, port, clearance on the bridge? port city marina. I hope we clear the bridge. I think we have two feet to spare. We get a taste of the Intracoastal Waterway, or ICW, as we head for the boatyard to get her hauled out for our refill. Is that high tide or low tide? and we take you along as we visit the Annapolis Fall Sailboat Show, the granddaddy of them all. So we've got to decide how to spend our money. Right. Wow. The key to cushions is cheers. Cheers. Thanks for watching. Do us a favor and subscribe to our channel, click the thumbs up button, and leave a comment down below. And remember, on SV Caterpillar, we take it one leg at a time.